Well, I just want to introduce our panelists today. I'm going to introduce them all at once in the order that they're going to present, and then we're going to start with our presentations. So Patrick Mobert, uh, he they is a queer harm reduction advocate and social worker who is passionate about community organizing. They hold a master's degree in creative practice from Arts Ed, City University of London, and a bachelor of social work degree from Dalhousie University in Chibuktuk, Halifax. Patrick is the Program and Outreach Coordinator at the Brunswick Street Mission, a co-program creator and facilitator of Untoxicated Queers. Patrick was also the policy researcher and peer lead on the Peer and Peer Project with the AIDS Coalition of Nova Scotia. Uh, he was a community trainee with the CBRC and program peer lead for the Substance User Network for the Atlantic Region. Uh, next, we have Andrew Thomas and Patrick as well, again, who will be presenting. Um, so Andrew Thomas is a research assistant in the Shag Lab uh, and completing a Master of Arts in Counseling Psychology at Yorkville University. He developed and coordinated the AIDS Coalition of Nova Scotia's Peer and Peer Program, uh, co-founded the PNP Project Halifax, and is part of the Gemergency Response, a collective that creates and distributes information on GHB, GBL, BDO, um, that is made by the community and for the community. Next. We have uh, Max Godet. Um, Max est un étudiant queer au doctorat en sciences publiques, option de la promotion de la santé. Son engagement auprès des communautés de S LGBTQIA+ euh, est ancré dans la justice sociale et la pensée critique. À l'aide d'une méthode par participative et basée sur l'art, le, la photo voix, euh, sa recherche doctorale vise à mieux comprendre les enjeux de consentement sexuel en contexte de chemsex. And finally, we have Richard Elliott. Um, Richard is a health and human rights lawyer, formerly head of the HIV Legal Network. He is now an independent consultant working uh, in the field of HIV, health, and human rights. Recent work includes prep preparing the Legal Network's new report and advocacy brief on harm reduction for GBT2Q people. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce, well, I'm going to let our first speaker take the reins. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Patrick Maubert. Um, I am uh, the co, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah? okay, sure. I, I am the, the co-founder and co-facilitator of Untoxicated Queers. Um, and our presentation today is uh, Queering Harm Reduction and Recovery Spaces. So UQ, um, was created as part support group, part sober events, part harm reduction initiative, and 100% queer. Um, we come together to support, connect, and hold space for 2SLGBTQIA plus uh, community members to chat about substance use and addictive behaviors of all kinds. So in sharing our experience of creating Untoxicated Queers, we aspire uh, to exchange knowledge today um, in creating and facilitating queer harm reduction and recovery uh, spaces to bridge the gap uh, and create safer and community-led systems of care uh, for our communities. So there we are. Um, that's me. And uh, that's Leanne Huri, who uh, is, you know, uh, my my person, right? Uh, they weren't able to be here today, um, but uh, certainly their passion and talents um, have really made UQ what it is. Uh, so a little bit about me, I am a queer person uh, with lived experience with substance use and addiction. I have navigated systems, uh, very broken systems, um, and you know, uh, you know, very much fell through those cracks. Uh, and now as a social worker, I work with people who are con continuing to fall through the cracks of our, uh, of our medical and uh, social systems. So, the whys. So why was this group created? So uh, we are based in Chibuktuk in, uh, in Halifax. Um, and you know, we were created to kind of just see what would happen if there was a, a more queer specific uh, not just abstinence-based recovery um, uh, model. Um, and it was going to be 
you know, uh, a very exciting uh, group we'd meet at the Glitter Bean Cafe, which is a, a queer cafe in town. Um, and that was March, uh, sorry, February 2020. And then as we all know, we quickly then became an online platform. Um, so the whys um, in looking at um, the, his the historical uh, ramifications of, especially in, in a town like Halifax, um, we are very much uh, a substance culture, a drinking culture, a bar culture. And so community was built you know, within those systems. Um, also, uh, stigma. Um, uh, you know, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir that we know that um, our communities face stigma uh, and feeling like uh, being on the outside of things. And if you combine that with the intersection of shame within the queer communities, uh, then you have sort of a, a perfect storm for intersectional shame. <laughs> um, and then recovery spaces, they're predominantly uh, cis, white, and heteronormative. Um, and the phobias, between the internal and external phobias, okay? So the hows, um, this is our, our group uh, at Halifax Pride uh, two years ago. Um, we developed uh, quite a few um, events sober events and also creating sober spaces within those events, which at the time was like, this is the first time we're doing this, it's so radical. Um, when really, you know, let's just have spaces that everyone can safely be a part of. Um, but it was pretty cool and we had a great turnout and it was a lot of fun. Um, great. See, I do like the paper the old school way here. Okay, okay. So the hows. Um, so Intoxicated Queers was created to provide a safer space uh, and support networks for people with lived and living experience with substance use and addiction. Um, in an attempt at queering um, the mental health and addiction systems, we approach substance use and addiction with a non-binary uh, viewpoint of a spectrum of care, um, everything from recovery to harm reduction, to wellness, um, and blending them all together, because we really believe that is really the essence of, of, of support. Um, we have um, monthly peer-led support groups, that's a healing space, and we have a monthly social event, which is you know, a joyous and celebratory space. Um, it, also it also fluctuates a lot, too, based on the needs of the people who are coming to the program. So this is a word from a, a member, uh, Amethyst. So UQ has been very helpful in getting to the root causes of my addictions, having a space to explore these topics with other queer and trans folks that understood where I'm coming from is amazing and not usually available in other sober support meetings. And I think it's true, right? We need spaces just for us. Um, and now looking at still more need, um, we definitely, definitely need more qualitative uh, and quantitative data on the lack of sober spaces and their positive, potential positive effects um, should be collected and analyzed to support the implementation of similar programs nationwide. Um, our communities interact with substances differently, um, influencing how we access uh, substance use related services. We need sex positive, queer gender affirming approaches um, to substance use services for our community uh, because we are uh, intersec intersecting identities. Now that's directly from the CBRC uh, report from uh, the summer 20 2022, um, but it's absolutely true uh, in looking at really finding ways um, to access harm reduction and recovery services must expand to meet the needs of all community members, particularly, particularly those already marginalized due to gender, racial and substance use identities. Um, other, thank you. Um, other, um, other more needs uh, is a, sh a shortage of queer competent healthcare facilities. Um, also this contributes to a high uh, substance use rates among our communities. Another is, ex uh, another explanation um, is that, another factor is that recovery based settings are less queer inclusive than they really could or should be. 
So this is a great quote here. It's, not, it's, it's just not enough to put, a, to put a rainbow on the flyer. And of course, we know that. Um, but that happens a lot, you know, with you know, recovery um, houses or uh, long-term care. Um, so really, implementation needs to be made within these systems, um, ideally by people like us, uh, who understand the needs of the people that will be using those services. Um, and so food for thought. So these are questions to you. Get more, if we had more time, we would uh, talk about this and have wonderful ideas. But maybe afterwards you can uh, write it down or come talk to me or something. So how do we care for members of our communities who engage with substances in harmful ways? Okay, like in your own lives. You know, how do you treat your friends or family or whoever who might live with substance use uh, challenges? Um, and how can we queer recovery and harm reduction spaces? How do we create safer spaces for QT BIPOC folks? And what will you do within your scope of practice and work to shine light on QT BIPOC engagement in harm reduction and recovery? Some food for thought. And I was just gonna close and wrap it up with a really beautiful quote that uh, one of our members, Ash, uh, gave us. And that's the intersectionality of 2S LGBTQ plus identities and substance use reflects a diverse tapestry of experiences blending resilience and resistance in the struggle against stigmas. In these intersections, our communities reshape the narrative of substance use and, ch and champions queer joy, health, and wellness. And I think that's absolutely true, and I think it's us coming together um, with that sort of beautiful paintbrush to create something very unique. So thanks, that is it, um, yes. And now, now I'm joined by the beautiful Andrew Thomas, everyone. <laughs> Inside and out. Okay. Okay, so uh, somewhat similar uh, presentation in that we're talking about a support group, but a greater project called the PMP Project. Um, pending funding, uh, I suppose. Uh, so how to create uh, supports for those with lived and living experience with PMP. Um, and the clicker, okay. So yeah, we had some introductions already, but we yeah. can do them again. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it again. Uh, no, uh, you know me. Um, hi. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Andrew Thomas joining him, uh, he, him pronouns. Um, uh, I do want to say a little plug for the G emergency response. Um, there have been four deaths and two hospitalizations, uh, GHB related uh, deaths and hospitalizations in Toronto in the last two weeks. Um, and on your tables, there's uh, some little postcards. There's a series of three postcards in two different styles. Um, they're not all available on the tables, but if you go to the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance website, um, they are there uh, for download. And the G emergency response is myself, Jordan Bon Gore from the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance, and Andy Lissard here from CBRC. Um, and the information is accurate, uh, and it tells the differences between BDO, GBL, and GHB. Um, so, moving on. <laughs> yeah. So, in a, in a way, um, kind of how we wanted to frame this this talk today was, you know, we created this um, kind of shoestring little group in a small. Um, city of Chibokto, Halifax, um, and you know we started off as a project with uh, the AIDS Coalition of Nova Scotia. We were funded for what ten? Ten months. Ten months, <laughs> and then it, it we didn't get refunded. So um, to coin a term I just heard, which I love, um, Sugar Daddy Kirk for a lot. Um, <laughs> Stepped, stepped in to be able to support the, the growth of the project moving forward. It's still pretty small, but uh, Kirk, that's a shout out for you. Um, uh, and the support that CBRC can give. Um, so it, we, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm lost here. Um, <laughs> we began as a, a peer-led support group. Um, yeah, I've already said that, I'm so sorry. So the highlights, very similar to Untoxicated Queers, is that it has the spectrum of care um, from abstinence-based recovery to harm reduction to uh, community wellness. 
Um, and this particular group has a model that is very socially driven um, in that we come together. Um, it's a grassroots uh, organization. Uh, but we come together, we eat food, we break bread. It's typically pizza. Um, and we have an opportunity to share experiences. Uh, it's a brave space allowing for participants to be vulnerable while remaining accessible. Um, and it's a, I think it's a pretty cool meeting format. Uh, we eat dinner. As we're eating dinner, we select uh, topics that we write down on a piece of paper. Um, and then throughout the rest of the time, we draw um, those topics and we share on them. And what's interesting is that a lot of the topics are pretty, you know, pretty serious stuff, but there's a lot of joy or feelings of, oh, we've, we've shared this lived experience. Um, and I think what we've discovered as well is that a lot of the sort of traumatic experiences that can come with, uh, with PMP experiences um, is certainly never talked about. So we just really wanted to have a space uh, for people to be able to engage um, and uh, yeah, and it provides validation of lived experiences. It's a gateway to care, connection, and a meal, um, and harm reduction and sex supplies. <laughs> I will say, Patrick and I both, uh, we are facilitators, but we are also there as uh, members and on the same level as uh, the other participants. Um, and I know I get as much as they do out of the meeting, uh, if not more. Um, it's a really special space. Um, so why would we create uh, a support group or a, have a PMP project? Um, there are zero supports in Nova Scotia and there's very few across the country as you're probably aware. Um, and what does exist is not culturally competent. Um, you can't go into a typical NA meeting and talk about your sexual experiences. Uh, you can't go in right after coming from a meth orgy and talk about that. That's just not appropriate. Um, I'm sure you get some looks. Uh, so, um, they also don't uh, incorporate people with lived experience. Um, so the supports I have uh, accessed in Toronto and in Nova Scotia, um, I walked in and I took one look at the person I knew they had no lived experience and they couldn't identify with the, uh, the you know, experiences that I've had with, with PMP, um, which I think is, is maybe not critical, but it's, it's certainly quite important uh, in, in counseling and, and uh, other supports. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to create something that, that had those aspects to it. Um, there's also massive barriers um, to accessing supports all across the country. Um, there's a lack of knowledge around PMP. There's a lack of knowledge uh, relating to what to do afterwards, sex aftermath. Um, how do you go back to normal sex? Um, then there's a high relapse rate. Uh, methamphetamine um, has, I think, one of the highest, if not the highest, uh, relapse rates out of all the drugs. Um, and we need supports for that inevitable potential relapse, I guess. Um, there's also rurality, rurality, I can't say the word. <laughs> the rural nature of Nova Scotia, um, it's hard to access supports. Um, most people live in, in rural communities, um, so you have to drive and, uh, and there might not be anything nearby. Um, then we have the highly stigmatized nature of PMP. You have uh, crystal meth, um, you have uh, sex, queerness, um, HIV potentially, um, there's a whole bunch of stigmatized uh, topics that are included there, um, making it very hard to talk about um, at times. There's also limited funding. We were, as Patrick mentioned, funded for 10 months. We doubled deliverables and uh, still weren't refunded. Um, and then finding other sources of support, uh, no one really wants to touch it. Um, supports are either focused on substance use or sexual health. Uh, there's not much that kind of blends the two um, of sex effusion, which is inevitable fusion of sex and drugs. And then our, the demographic of PMPers is hard to reach. Uh, they don't attend the typical events. Um, most of it's online, Grindr or Zoom or Telegram now. Um, and then in the Maritimes, at least, there's a massive increase in crystal meth availability and GHB availability. Um, I'm assuming it's across the country. It's growing like crazy, but specifically there, uh, there's a change after COVID. So there's zero supports and a huge increase in use. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so where we've been challenged. So some of our challenges, um, as, as Andrew mentioned, is recruitment, right? So I think a lot of folks are, it's, you know, it's an intersection of shame, like, oh, 
people will find out that's, that you know I have an experience with PMP or uh, Crystal Matthews or whatever, um, and you know my my secret will be told. Also, just recruitment by trying to like spread the word. Um, advertising falls into that as well. I don't know if you noticed that really super sexy uh, visual on the first slide. Yeah. So that was like our like logo for a while, and no one was resharing it. Right? It's too much. Um, but of course, it really captures that scene pretty well. Uh, so we've had to kind of, kind of, um, I guess, um, lighten it up a bit. Uh, so confidentiality, it's tricky, right? Because when in a, in a small place, the reality is we probably all have seen each other naked, one way or another, you know? Um, so that creates a whole new series of um, relationships. Uh, dual relationships, exactly, and small city stigma and shame. Um, a lot of people like, have no idea what this thing is, um, and we run it out of my place of work, the Brunswick Street Mission, which is like kind of progressive, but it's like a United Church. Um, but they're like, great, yeah, bring that PMP project here, uh, which is great. Uh, what has not, uh, what, uh, yes, lives a challenge. What has worked is the format is strong. Um, people the conversations are really freely flowing. It's low barrier, location is accessible, um, and we are able to provide uh, uh, supplies, like harm reduction supplies, um, and a meal. Yeah, the people have really liked the format. It's kind of a, a mix of a few things, and um, the feedback we're getting is that it's really accessible. Um, yeah. Uh, so what we need going forward, uh, we are hoping to expand and we are applying for funding um, because we'd like to provide more than just a support group. Um, but yeah, we need more funds allocated to uh, queer harm reduction in general. Um, and then a decrease, we'd hope, a decrease in stigma around PMP uh, by talking, talking about it. Uh, that's a way to reduce uh, stigma. So yeah, go shed it from the rooftops. Um, and then we need more culturally competent service providers. Um, there really are none. I mean, I'm seeing a counselor in uh, Toronto because there's nothing in Nova Scotia. Um, some people claim that they can uh, competently counsel me, but I, I, I uh, object to that. They don't uh, know what they're talking about. Um, so uh, utilization of appropriate language, um, know the language of PMP, um, using overly technical or overly uh, clinical language um, doesn't, doesn't really land. Um, and then service providers need to have an openness to learn about PMP and discuss PMP. Um, hopefully, uh, with an upcoming webinar, we can, we can help with that. Um, and then supported incorporation of those with lived and living experience. Um, can't stress this enough. Uh, it's, it's super important um, to have that. Uh, and to, I guess, to uh, consult uh, when developing programs as well. Um, you should be part of all of it. Uh, so, mm. Yeah. And then any questions? questions? Yeah. But we can save that till the end. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Bonjour. Euh, merci à vous tous d'être ici aujourd'hui. Merci au CBRC aussi de, de me recevoir. Je m'appelle Max et je suis étudiant au doctorat en santé publique à l'Université de Montréal. Aujourd'hui, je viens vous parler euh, des enjeux de consentement et de violence sexuelle dans des contextes de chemsex à travers une métasynthèse qualitative. Donc, pour vous dire un peu plus sur euh, le contexte de la situation, donc, les violences sexuelles ont, causent diverses conséquences, euh, tant sur la santé physique que mentale, euh, que sexuelle et sociale, et ces conséquences peuvent être tant à court terme qu'à long terme. En regardant les statistiques, 
euh, on voit que les statistiques de violences sexuelles, on voit que les hommes cis hétérosexuels vivent beaucoup moins de violences sexuelles que les personnes bispirituelles, les hommes gays, bisexuels et queer, et les personnes trans et non-binaires. Et parmi ces communautés, celles qui font du chemsex vivent encore plus de violences sexuelles. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'est le chemsex? Euh, J'imagine si vous êtes ici, vous avez probablement une idée, mais la définition sur laquelle on se base, c'est que le chemsex réfère à la consommation de certaines substances, euh, de certaines drogues, avec l'intention d'avoir de la sexualité auprès des communautés euh, 2SGBTQ+. Pourquoi s'intéresser au consentement aussi? En fait, le consentement est essentiel à la prévention des violences sexuelles et permettrait peut-être aussi de promouvoir euh, la santé sexuelle auprès de ces communautés. Qu'est-ce qu'une métasynthèse qualitative? Donc, euh, un grand mot académique. Euh, pour vous dire assez simplement, ça réfère à une analyse secondaire de données ou d'articles qui sont déjà publiés, souvent des articles scientifiques. Mais c'est plus que l'accumulation ou l'agrégation de données comme dans une revue de la littérature. Une métasynthèse vise à avoir une nouvelle compréhension, une nouvelle interprétation. Ça répond à une nouvelle question de recherche et euh, ça apporte de nouvelles contributions. Puis pourquoi cette méthode? En fait, quand je lisais des articles sur le chemsex, je pouvais souvent repérer dans les, euh, dans les extraits des participants des indices de violence sexuelle mais que c'était souvent très peu analysé euh, comme, les, comme les objectifs de recherche des auteurs ou des chercheurs n'étaient pas liés au consentement ou aux violences sexuelles. Donc, on se retrouvait avec plusieurs données qui étaient sous-analysées et euh, en les prenant, en les réanalysant, je pensais pouvoir euh, faire avancer les connaissances en évitant de sur-solliciter la communauté et aussi en réduisant les risques liés à la participation si je collectais des données auprès de personnes qui ont vécu une violence sexuelle. Un peu plus sur mes méthodes, donc les, euh, la stratégie de recherche, j'ai combiné deux catégories de mots-clés. Euh, D'abord, une par rapport au chemsex et au PNP, l'autre catégorie par rapport à la recherche qualitative, donc des mots-clés comme entrevue, focus group, phénoménologie. Et puis, j'ai inséré ces mots-clés-là dans, euh, dans des bases de données. Les mots-clés devaient apparaître tant, soit dans le titre, dans le résumé ou dans les mots-clés. Un mot-clé de, de chaque catégorie devait apparaître. Et puis, euh, les résultats, on a, eu, on a trouvé 348 articles avec, euh, avec ces mots-clés-là, mais en retirant les doublons, euh, seulement 292 euh, articles ont été révisés en lisant d'abord le titre et le résumé. On voulait s'assurer que les articles étaient publiés depuis 2013, qu'ils portaient sur le chemsex, qu'il y avait des données empiriques qualitatives en français ou en anglais. Donc, à cette étape-ci, on voulait s'assurer de, de, de repérer toute la recherche qualitative sur le chemsex. Et c'est seulement à la prochaine étape, lorsqu'on a lu les textes entiers, donc on a lu 91 textes entiers, où ce que je voulais repérer euh, les, les, les textes qui parlent aussi de consentement ou de violence sexuelle. On s'est retrouvé avec 23 articles au total qui ont été analysés à l'aide d'une synthèse thématique. Donc, les résultats, euh, je vais vous dire, les résultats sont préliminaires, l'analyse est encore en cours, mais on semble identifier quatre grands thèmes, quatre thèmes généraux. Le premier est que les notions de violence sexuelle sont peu reconnues ou discutées, euh, ce qui renforcerait peut-être une, une croyance que les violences sont inévitables dans des contextes euh, de chemsex. Et ce, ce manque de reconnaissance vient tant de la part des participants des études qui, par exemple, parlent parfois de leur expérience sans reconnaître que c'est une violence sexuelle ou sans s'identifier comme victime, que de la part des chercheurs lorsque les participants euh, parlent de violences sexuelles et que les chercheurs ne, ne les analysent pas par la suite. J'ai mis des extraits des articles en tant que tels. Les articles sont en anglais, donc c'est pour ça que les, les extraits sont aussi en anglais. Euh, mais je les ai juste ajoutés à titre euh, illustratif. Et on, on, ce processus de, de manque de reconnaissance viendrait peut-être normaliser les violences sexuelles dans les contextes de chemsex. Deuxièmement, euh, les complexités et les normes spécifiques au chemsex viennent peut-être brouiller les frontières entre les actes consensuels et non consensuels. 
Donc, ces spécificités sont entre autres le sexe euh, en groupe. Donc, en contexte de chemsex, souvent, le sexe est pratiqué en groupe et avec plusieurs partenaires, ce qui viendrait peut-être euh, brouiller euh, les lignes entre les actes consensuels et non consensuels lorsqu'une personne consent d'avoir de la sexualité avec une personne, mais pas l'autre. Il y a aussi euh, une idée de, de rechercher des émotions plus fortes, rechercher plus, ce qui viendrait aussi contribuer à brouiller, euh, ces, brouiller cette frontière. Ensuite, euh, certains auteurs réfèrent à l'idée que le seul fait de prendre ou de consommer une substance agirait comme le consentement. Donc, les personnes présumeraient le consentement par le seul fait d'être en, en contexte de consommation avec quelqu'un d'autre. Et puis, euh, en, contexte de, en contexte de chemsex, il y a aussi une certaine normalisation des états d'inconscience, souvent liés à une surdose de GHB ou de GBL. Donc, les participants peuvent se trouver en état de conscience et d'inconscience et passer rapidement d'un état de plaisir à un état de détresse, ce qui viendra encore une fois brouiller les frontières entre les actes consensuels et non consensuels. Troisièmement, la dynamique entre le contrôle de soi et l'inhibition façonne les limites sexuelles des individus et, revient, et redéfinisserait leurs propres normes euh, de consentement. Donc, les, personnes, euh, les participants des études disent souvent découvrir de nouvelles pratiques sexuelles euh, en contexte de chemsex, que ce soit le fisting, euh, la fluidité euh, des, des rôles sexuels, donc une, une personne top qui devient bottom, euh, ou un homme gay qui a une relation sexuelle avec une femme. Donc, on, et là, ce qui est particulier de, de ces nouvelles pratiques sexuelles, c'est qu'elles euh, sont euh, possibles uniquement en raison du chemsex. Donc, il y, aurait une certaine, euh, il y aurait une certaine redéfinition de, leur, de ce, qui est, ce que les personnes acceptent de faire ou non, donc de leurs propres normes de consentement. En même temps, pour certaines personnes, euh, ils viennent parfois dépasser leurs limites, ils viennent parfois aller trop loin dans, euh, dans les actes qu'ils euh, qui acceptent de faire. Et finalement, quatrièmement, euh, le chemsex est souvent discuté d'une façon négative dans la littérature ou du moins à partir d'un paradigme de risque. Euh, puis, mais on retrouve quand même dans ces articles des indices euh, de, qui, qui sont à l'inverse, donc des personnes qui, euh, pour qui le, le chemsex viendrait augmenter la connexion avec les personnes, avec le, leur partenaire sexuel, même si la personne est un inconnu. Les participants nomment parfois aussi que le, les drogues permettent d'accroître l'empathie et que ça permettrait aussi d'accroître la notion de « care » pour l'autre, ce qui viendrait favoriser des pratiques de consentement. Le chemsex est donc parfois vu dans ces contextes-là comme un espace sécuritaire pour explorer une nouvelle sexualité. Et euh, il y a aussi des indices dans, dans la littérature de de personnes qui sont euh, très attentives à leur partenaire sexuel et qui viennent reconfirmer le consentement euh, à travers leurs échanges. Euh, dans, dans ce contexte, le chemsex serait vu comme une communauté, une communauté qui prend soin d'elle-même. Donc, pour conclure, euh, cette méthode-synthèse met en lumière que euh, nous apporte une compréhension qui est contextualisée, qui est nuancée des violences sexuelles, mais met aussi en lumière un peu la complexité euh, liée au consentement dans ces contextes-là. Par exemple, quand on regarde euh, les lignes brouillées entre le consentement et les violences sexuelles, on peut peut-être comprendre que ces deux choses ne sont peut-être pas mutuellement exclusives, au sens qu'elles pourraient exister en même temps dans un certain contexte. Par contre, la normalisation des violences sexuelles dans de tels contextes met aussi en lumière le besoin de sensibilisation et le besoin d'intervention qui doit venir des communautés, qui doivent être faites pour et par les communautés euh, de chemsex. Ces interventions pourraient aussi miser sur les forces des communautés, par exemple miser euh, sur l'empathie, le care et la connexion envers l'autre. Par contre, on a encore besoin d'une meilleure compréhension du consentement euh, dans des contextes de chemsex, de comment il est donné, retiré ou négocié. Et c'est dans ce contexte que s'insère la prochaine phase de mon projet doctoral, qui sera un projet photovoix, une méthode participative qui visera à mieux comprendre comment le consentement est donné, négocié ou retiré dans des contextes de chemsex. 
la, troisi la troisième phase viendra à intégrer les résultats des deux, des deux premières phases et à, et à identifier des stratégies, des actions communautaires en mobilisant les connaissances. Mon projet est supervisé par un comité consultatif communautaire. Et euh, je suis justement en recrutement pour la deuxième phase, donc le projet Photovoix. Si vous connaissez des, des personnes qui font du chemsex à Montréal et qui, euh, qui seraient intéressées, intéressées à prendre part, vous pouvez leur transmettre euh, cette affiche ou euh, ils peuvent en rentrer en contact avec moi. Le QR code... Oh, pardon, j'ai... <rire> le QR code mène à mon adresse courriel. Donc, j'aimerais remercier... Euh, J'aimerais vous remercier pour votre écoute aujourd'hui. J'aimerais remercier les bailleurs de fonds, les CRSC pour supporter, euh, pour financer en partie ce projet, le CRSH et le FARQ pour financer en partie mes activités de recherche. J'aimerais aussi remercier mes superviseurs de recherche, Olivier Ferlat, qui est ici dans la salle, et Adam Bourne. Et euh, merci au CBRC de, de m'offrir l'opportunité de venir parler de mes recherches. Merci. Uh, hi, my name is Richard. Um, I'm really grateful to CBRC for the opportunity to present to you today some work that I've been doing for the HIV Legal Network, uh, one of the national HIV organizations that um, does research, education, and advocacy on a range of human rights issues related to HIV and uh, key populations that are affected by HIV, which obviously includes queer people and people who use drugs, and especially um, people who fall into both demographics. Um, this is a project that's been funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada under the Community Action Fund. I want to acknowledge that. Thank you. And um, the purpose of the project is to uh, contribute to some of the collective efforts that have been underway for several years now in Canada to respond to uh, challenges related to substance use, particularly problematic substance use, because, of course, we also are very... Um, keen to uh, constantly recognize that the majority of substance use is not problematic for people. Uh, but that's not to deny that there is problematic substance use and that we need to better protect and promote the health and other human rights of our communities. And um, there hasn't really been uh, a particularly uh, concrete and coordinated, I would say, national response across multiple domains to address problematic substance use amongst queer people. There have been uh, really important initiatives that are happening across the country. We've heard about some of them already today. But we felt that there might be something to add to the efforts um, by actually articulating some sort of agenda for advocacy across multiple domains that might strengthen this response. And so that's the purpose of this project. The context, of course, um, is that we know there are higher rates of substance use, including problematic use amongst GBT2Q people. We also know from the literature and from lived experience and people working in the field that the patterns of substance use can be different for queer and trans people. Um, there is certainly, for example, Canadian data showing a much higher prevalence of crystal meth use amongst queer men specifically. Um, but there's less data about some other populations we'll get into in a moment. Um, and of course, in responding to the challenges of problematic substance use amongst queer people, we need to acknowledge the reasons that people are using, including pleasure, chief among them, um, but also that there are connections between people's substance use and our sexual identities, our sexual networks, our sexual behaviors, and that if we don't address those as part of the response, the response is going to be uh, misguided and miss the mark. Um, we know, of course, that uh, GBMSM and people who use drugs individually are amongst the key populations in the HIV epidemic, and obviously GBMSM who use drugs are at heightened risk of HIV. At the same time, both of those populations face barriers to harm reduction and other health services. And of course, if you are a queer person who's also using substances, um, the intersection of those identities is going to mean additional barriers. In the report, um, 
we go into some more detail, not as much as I would like for reasons of budget limitations. Uh, but of course, there are also multiple other identities that queer people who use drugs have, and those add additional layers of stigma and complexity and barriers often to accessing services. Um, now, it's also the case that it's only really, I would say, in the last decade or so that there's been a significant increase in the research into problematic substance use, specifically amongst queer people. Um, much of that has been focused on chemsex, but it's important for us, of course, not to lose sight of other um, substance use amongst queer people that can be problematic. And so even though there's been this growth in the literature quite significant over the last decade, we still have many gaps in the research to inform our responses. There are still, as we've heard from some of the other presentations, few programs that are specifically for queer and trans people who use drugs. The services that do exist that ought to be able to help us, often we face multiple barriers in accessing those, including stigma and then sort of broader contextual barriers of criminalization that feeds into that stigma. And there's been relatively little attention to the need for action at the level of public policy to address a number of these things. And um, it was noted, I think, by Patrick that the stigma and the shame that people, queer people who use drugs experience is intersectional. Uh, I think that also means that our advocacy needs to be intersectional. And it's striking to me that despite the real prominence of queer people in drug policy advocacy work and harm reduction advocacy, there's actually still been this sort of neglect of the ways in which those are issues relevant for queer people specifically. Um, and I think on the flip side, it's also fair to say that queer advocacy has not, for the most part, wanted to touch issues of substance use, and there hasn't been a strong presence of queer rights advocacy organizations in drug policy reform work. So I think those two movements actually share a lot in common, or ought to, including at the level of principle. Um, and I think there's, there's space to try to strengthen those, uh, those, those efforts at coordination and collaboration and advocacy between queer rights organizations and drug policy reform uh, advocates. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the summary report um, today. It's not out yet. We'll release it uh, in early 2024 once we complete the accompanying action agenda, which is what I wanna talk about today and create an opportunity to hear feedback about. But just to say that the report that we prepared drew upon a reasonably extensive review of the literature, including what literature there is available about specific populations of queer people who use drugs. So um, black communities, indigenous people, people with disabilities, trans people, uh, people experiencing poverty and homelessness, um, queer people who use drugs with experience of arrest and incarceration, uh, young queer people, there's nothing out there about older queer people using drugs that I could find in the literature. Uh, and we spoke to a number of key informants, several of whom are in the room. Thank you very much for that. And tried to do a scan as of several months ago of what was happening with programs across the country, and in particular, to what extent were any of the federal initiatives and funding programs that might be relevant to addressing harm reduction needs amongst queer people actually doing so. Uh, we didn't try to look at all the different provincial levels because that was just going to be too much. Um, based on those sources of information, we then tried to articulate a draft agenda for action, and it is very much a draft, I want to stress. And I'm just going to very briefly, in the time that remains, give you a sense of the kinds of things that we think might be done to strengthen harm reduction amongst queer people uh, in Canada in these domains of research, education, and awareness, uh, improvement of services, uh, specifically addressing the needs of queer people who use drugs in queer community organizations and spaces, uh, what might be done in terms of government funding and strategies, and then some legal and policy reforms. So in the domain of research, um, two sort of overarching recommendations. The first is that there are existing large-scale surveys um, nationally that gather data related to the health of people in Canada in various uh, domains. There's an opportunity, as has been recommended into, in a recent parliamentary study into queer health in Canada, 
to actually improve some of the data collection to address the needs of queer communities, including people who use drugs, um, using some of those existing surveys, and I think we should take advantage of those. But there's definitely a need to fund additional research specifically into the needs of queer people who use drugs, particularly clinical research for some more effective interventions for problematic substance use uh, for those for whom that's needed, but also implementation research, as was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations about best practices. And within that, I think it's important to name some priority populations for research that have not traditionally received the kind of funding for research, including for addressing harm reduction needs amongst trans people, um, black, indigenous, and other racialized communities, and people with disabilities in particular. In the domain of education and awareness, um, just uh, at a higher level, there's a need for actually strengthening the non-stigmatizing evidence-based information for queer communities about substances, about harm reduction practices, access to services, and so on in various formats and through various platforms that are actually going to reach our communities. And because our communities, are unfortunately, are not immune to the stigma surrounding substance use that we're surrounded with in our society as a whole, we also need actually to see some very deliberate anti-stigma initiatives within the queer community around substance use and challenging anti-drug user stigma, including in relation to chemsex or PNP, as has been mentioned in one of the previous presentations. There's a lot of work to be done in the domain of services. Um, in particular, queer-focused uh, outreach, harm reduction outreach, in various ways and various spaces. Uh, to get harm reduction information services and tools out to queer people, there's really important work happening in places across the country, but it's not been taken to scale, it's not enough, it needs to be better funded. There's clearly a need for better integration and coordination of some services, the literature and key informants make this clear, including, for example, opportunities to integrate harm reduction services into services that queer people are already using, including sexual health services. Um, We've heard about the need to expand the services that are available to queer people. That needs to include queer specific services, services that are specifically by and for queer people with previous or current experience of substance use, including hiring and supporting and paying peers to do that work. But we know that we also need to rely upon non-queer services to be able to meet our needs. And so there's a range of interventions about building the competence of those service providers to actually respond effectively to the needs of queer people who use substances. There's also, I think, a role for regulators to actually set and enforce some standards of practice um, to ensure that people can access non-stigmatizing, non-discriminating care. Um, and we need to actually also um, address some of the upstream determinants of health that, of course, are factors that contribute to substance use becoming problematic for some people, um, including housing, income, and mental health supports. I mentioned the need for addressing um, stigma within our own queer community spaces, and I think there's an important role here for our community organizations that are queer that have not engaged with this to actually speak out against anti-drug user stigma, to think about how they can integrate access to harm reduction services and information and tools into their own work. Uh, I think we need to look at some of the online spaces that queer people um, use to connect, including for substance, sexualized substance use, and challenge some of the stigmatizing policies and practices uh, of online services and the hookup apps and so on. Um, and we need both queer and drug policy reform advocates to actually take up the health of queer people who use substances um, as a concern. Um, let me wrap up with two final areas. The first is that um, in the area of government and initiatives and strategies, at the federal level, there are at least three domains in which the federal government has adopted some strategies with attached money that are relevant to addressing harm reduction amongst queer people. The first, of course, is in our HIV and STBVI strategies. The next iteration of the federal action plan is currently underway. It will be very important for that action plan to specifically name harm reduction amongst queer and trans people as an area of priority, which hopefully then will lead to some money attached to it. Um, our drug strategies also need to specifically acknowledge uh, sexualized substance use amongst queer people and non-sexualized use. And there is a federal action plan on 2S LGBTQ plus communities, not a single mention of those of us who use substances that ought to be rectified, it seems to me. Homelessness, housing, and poverty reduction strategies obviously are also relevant. And one of the key informants that we spoke to made this very important point 
that with the funding that is made available, there needs to be some dedicated funding that is very low threshold to access, that doesn't require jumping through the kinds of hoops that getting a CIHR grant, for example, uh, requires, or that is attached to research, but that is actually more accessible to community. And then finally, more broadly, at the macro level, there's a whole bunch of legal and policy reforms that are needed. Um, these are not obviously queer specific, but they have impl huge implications for queer people who use drugs. Decriminalization, a civil society uh, organizations across the country have called for. Scaling up safer supply. Um, I note that at the moment we have no peer-led models of safer supply other than the Drug User Liberation Front um, here in Vancouver, which Health Canada denied an exemption for and whose organizers have recently been targeted by police. We need to end the crackdown on the sale of poppers, um, as CBRC and others have advocated. Um, we could make access to harm reduction services that are currently threatened by the criminal regime um, easier um, through a number of legislative reforms, uh, decriminalize sex work, uh, their clients, their workspaces, and then we could actually set a really nice precedent if we actually adopted some anti-discrimination protection for people based on substance use, which we don't have in Canada at the moment, except in a very limited way. So uh, those are, in general, the kinds of things that we think would make up a useful advocacy platform that we would hope uh, HIV organizations, queer organizations, harm reduction organizations, et cetera, could get behind for, in Canada. If you have thoughts about any of those things, I'd love to hear about them. Um, here's my contact information. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to share with you. Right. So thank you to our amazing presenters for those fantastic four presentations. Merci à tous nos présentateurs d'avoir présenté des uh, si belles présentations. Ça fait bien de la présentation que j'ai dit dans ma phrase. Um, donc on va passer maintenant à la, la période de questions-réponses. We're going to open it up uh, to questions from the crowd. So if folks would like to ask questions to any or multiple of our uh, presenters, please just step up to the microphone so that uh, people can hear you. Um, and if there is ever a lull, I have also some questions, but we are going to start off at the mic. Hello, thank you so much for that. My name is Jaris and I'm a pharmacist and I'm wondering if uh, in all of your work and in the respective geographic locations where you do your work, what's the availability like, if at all, for testing drugs uh, like before use to see if there's something else in there, like keeping people alive, right? Um, I wonder how and where and if that has come up. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, great question. It would be great if, if, uh, if pharmacies um, got behind that. I don't think I've ever heard of any pharmacies, locally anyway, uh, doing that kind of work. But that would make a lot of sense. Maybe you'd have more yeah. on that. Yeah, um, there's limited access to testing in Nova Scotia anyway. Um, there's no spectrometer there. I believe the Peers Alliance got one in PEI. Um, but there's just the, the fentanyl test strips. Um, there's a few xylazine and benzo ones as well, but there's, yeah, very limited access and they're pricey. Um, so yeah, it's not great uh, access to testing. Yes, we have another question. Thanks for the amazing panel. My name is Robert. Nice to um, meet you all. And I think, Max, I think we've met before. It's nice yeah. to see you, beautiful. Um, I have one comment, one comment and a question, one specific question. Um, Patrick, you asked us to reflect on QT BIPOC work. I think one of the um, really strong lessons is that um, giving ourselves permission that it's okay to make room for specific groups, um, just speaking from my own professional and personal experience as a black gay queer man, um, you know, anti-black blackness is a global phenomenon and exists in QT BIPOC spaces, and so sometimes that in of itself is a barrier to getting folks in the room, so it's okay to have black spaces, um, black queer spaces, um, and then using that as a place to help build resiliency and coming out to the larger community. Um, I was curious, I don't know if it's a comment or statement, but um, I know when I was working full-time in um, community-based organizations a few years ago, there was quite a lot of work around PMP, chem sex, a lot of interventions, and so what other best practices have you been able to look at or know of? Um, I know GMSH and um, 
Ontario, Max Ottawa in, has done a lot of great work uh, with their Split of Tea, which is now Tea to Go program in terms of harm reduction dispensing. They used to have a, um, I don't know if they still do or had um, a community group, um, peer like group around folks who wanted to use in a sustainable way. Um, and so I know sometimes the, in the silos of Canada that exist, we often look up instead of around. Um, but my specific question was in terms of what anti-racism work or platforms um, you've looked at or have you considered in terms of work, um, and thinking particularly in terms of sexual racism and how that presents particularly in the PNP community. Um, I think about 10 years ago, a lot of research came out from the West Coast in which how um, party drugs are um, held as a source of power by white gay men, um, a lot of um, use as a um, entry level into gay spaces. You can join us if you do these drugs and or sometimes those drugs are given uh, consensually, something that lives rent free in my head of working with the, um, or a safer party advisory community we had, which happened to be all white gay men, but they were very honest in their admission of how sexual racism exists in Ottawa, in which you know Asian men are specifically excluded because of stereotypes, they're viewed as bottoms, femme, and black men are particularly invited because of sexual stereotypes, um, being tops, being considered more sexually aggressive. Um, so just curious if that's come up in any work, in your, either of your discussions or in your research, and how has that impacted that? I mean, the PMP project is kind of just getting off the ground, um, but um, yeah, we, we consult with uh, you know people, uh, BIPOC people, um, in in yeah, they're, they're members of our, I guess our. We're members of our community advisory team with the Peer and Peer Project, um, or sorry, yeah, Peer and Peer Program at the AIDS Coalition. Um, so going forward, yeah, um, we'd want uh, input from from the BIPOC community, um, and we do have a few who attend regularly to our PMP project. Um, but yeah, we're just getting started, so um, mm. I don't know how else. I can... Yeah, I know with you with UQ, we um, a, a dream of ours is to have like a like a closed space. Um, so that's kind of in the work with, uh, with my partner, Leanne. Um, so yeah, watch this space, I guess. Puis Maxime, je sais pas si tu avais-tu d'autres choses à ajouter? Okay. I see a, another a person coming up to the microphone. Hi, uh, thank you for the panel, it was great. Um, this question might be more for Richard or it's open-ended, but I presented yesterday on sort of social determinants of health, and I think in that conversation, sometimes it's hard to not just talk about every social issue intersecting with every other social issue. In particular, I presented on queer and trans food insecurity. So I'm wondering sort of in your work, how you sort of make the case for social determinants of health while not sort of getting bogged down in like everything intersects and everything is a problem. So yeah, how you make that case in sort of harm reduction spaces. Um, the question, in a way, was sort of rhetorical, right? Because it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you do that? Um, I, I think uh, for this project, we were, I mean, there's so much to cover about all the things that go into substance use uh, potentially being problematic for people and the supports that are needed. Um, we certainly wanted to say something about the need for upstream interventions uh, to address a range of social determinants um, like poverty, houselessness, uh, food insecurity, um, which are, can be causes, but also consequences, um, that the, the relationship is bi-directional. Um, so that's why I think one of the recommendations in here is that other strategies that might not immediately come to mind when you're thinking about drugs and sex and the combination of the two actually need to be part of our thinking if we're gonna strengthen harm reduction amongst queer people, as we do amongst many people, we need to be thinking upstream as well. Um, and also for those whose problematic substance use is linked in various ways to homelessness, lack of access to housing, et cetera, there's a need for housing service providers, for example, to actually recognize that as a population and make, create queer safe spaces for people who are using. Um, so, I mean, there's lots that can be said about it. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer for where you draw the lines because you could just go on ad infinitum. But. Is the siren coming up? 
Yeah, um, real quick question for Richard, but anyone feel free to answer. And thank you all so much for um, kind of this very important work um, that you're doing on these issues. Uh, kind of a political question getting into politics, but I saw that you mentioned the Drug User Liberation Front, um, which I just want to highlight, is led by a trans woman, Aris Nix, who has been arrested. I mean, I consider her at this point like a political prisoner because what she's doing is for harm reduction work, and we've seen some changes at the provincial level. I know that they tried to get a meeting with Eve Duclo and kind of different support from it, as you mentioned that they had had a lot of pushback from the federal government, but we see that BC is having this decriminalization pilot here um, with which I believe with cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin, some other substances, but not GHB and GBL. So I'm wondering, one, how can kind of, and, and you mentioned this a little bit, sort of queer needs and queer voices and interests become a part of those movements? Um, and two, just politically, how can we create space, whether it's through researchers, like I feel that the Delph is very much like a grassroots group that politicians are having a great time demonizing and getting a lot of political capital out of demonizing, but they're the ones who are really pushing the vanguard on this and doing some amazing work. Like they've been, you know, they've came out with some community-based studies that showed lower, lower rates of overdose um, and deaths in the downtown east side among the folks that are using their services. So I really see that as an incredible community-based solution. So how can kind of the folks within establishment, more established institutions support that work that's being really demonized and how can we kind of create queer space within those advances like the BC decriminalization program? That's such a great question and other people might have thoughts too, but wouldn't it be great if we actually had queer organizations who had not had much of a track record dealing with harm reduction or substance use actually putting out statements of solidarity with Dolph encouraging donations to Dolph. Go to their website, by the way, and support them. They're doing really important work. Give them money. Um, yeah, that would be a really awesome thing to do. And I think that does then help, that, that more legitimately uh, goes along with a request that uh, drug, user, drug user liberation advocacy, harm reduction advocacy, drug policy reform work should attend to the needs of queer people um, who use drugs as part of a broader vision. Uh, you know, the drug policy reform movement, of which I consider myself a member, uh, has done a lot of work over the years calling attention to issues of gender and race and class and how the war on drug plays out and other populations like rural uh, subsistence producers, for example, who get targeted. Um, but queer people have been, until very, very recently, largely absent in those discussions, even though if you look around the room <laughs> in those meetings, you know, it's like one in three people are queer who are doing this drug policy work, uh, and yet somehow we're not talking about ourselves in that work. Um, so I think we could legitimately say, no, 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 wait, we're here too. Um, but I think showing up to support non-queer drug user advocacy is important too. Yeah, busy, go for it. Hello, my question is for um, the PNP project and for Untoxicated. I uh, work with the Health Initiative for Men's PNP and Me program and something that's kind of come up now and again is the delicate balance of catering to people with harm reduction based goals and catering to people with abstinence based goals. So I'm just curious as people who are working in a very similar environment, how you kind of navigate that back and forth in a way that you're, <laughs> that works. Yeah, I, I, I think for, for us, I think like very quickly adopting like language and formats that just didn't have like the other sort of um, like fixings of a like recovery group, you know? So, you know, talking about goals of the week, you know, versus uh, clean, like clean time milestones or whatever. Um, and as well, being able to, um, yeah, basically being able to um, support and celebrate people where they're at. And it's just as valid for someone to come in, you know, and they, drank more water that day um, <laughs> than, you know, they had X amount of years of not using, right? Mm -hmm. So, anything to add to that? Um, just in regards to, I guess, it's slightly different between the two groups, um, I think, anyway, um, that, you know, there is, there's no expectation that you come sober to the PMP project. Um, obviously, if someone's, like, really tweaking, um, might make some people uncomfortable, but there's that, there's that kind of, Everyone knows that you know that is a possibility, and if, if that's going to set you off, um, then maybe you won't come to that. But um, I feel like that's kind of you can come however you are. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think the term like wellness I think is so important to, to get out of even harm reduction and recovery are are so sort of polarizing. I think wellness is a really good um, term. 
Thank you so much. Would love to chat more about this in the little breaks. So I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> yeah, we have another question on the mic. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, how you do recruitment for your programs. So um, I'm also with Health Initiative for Men and I run our social drop-in space, the after party. Um, and I think the struggle I have is, you know, we can't talk about it on the app, so net reach is really difficult. But then when we go into these like physical spaces like the bathhouses, um, like to be honest, sometimes when I go there and I see my poster, it's a little bit of a buzzkill. And I want to be mindful of, you know, even if we're, you know, also folks who party or whatever, like how do we come into these party spaces to promote these programs in a way that's like, you know, I don't want to imply that everyone there needs the help, but like how do we offer that this is a space if you do want it without being invasive and without being that, that buzzkill basically. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I think um, that's a great question. And it's really tricky with PMP because I mean, there's a, there's a lot of like stigmatization uh, surrounding, especially, you know, crystal meth use. Um, that it's you know it's 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 a really major drug and I mean there's realities too that that it's a very addictive drug and and there's certainly lots of problematic um, uh, series of events that happens after you start using it for a while. However, it's not all it's not all bad necessarily. And of course, there's reasons why people are using it. And I think as uh, as Richard mentioned, you know the the understanding of pleasure as a as a as a reason why people are, are engaging, I think is really important to understand that it is a balance. I think um, right now I'm looking at do, doing some interventions in the Zoom rooms. Um, when you're talking about PMP, um, you want people, or you want you don't you can't pay someone to go into you know the bathhouse and well I guess you can and <laughs> sit there in clothing and and but you can't do that with the Zoom room like someone fully dressed, sitting on webcam in a big PMP zero room is not gonna be, is not gonna, not gonna be okay. Um, so looking at peers maybe who already engage in, in that sort of um, behavior, but already attend the Zoom rooms, um, maybe paying them to sit there, um, those who maybe aren't as, as deep in their use or, or um, whatever to provide support. Um, so I think kind of like meeting people where they're at, but also, yeah, um, having people who are maybe participating as well. Um, in the parties, the PMP parties, or um, Zoom rooms, or bathos. Um, that might be something to look at. Um, yeah. For sure, so like a, like a combination of uh, acknowledging the different reasons why people use, like the pleasure within that in the sort of recruitment strategies, and then plus working with folks, so thank you. Yeah, cool. All right, yeah, we have another question. We have roughly uh, four minutes left, so this question, and maybe one more if we have time, but we'll go to the mic. So I'm a mental health worker with PHS, which we provide housing for uh, people who use drugs. Um, my question's around uh, safe spaces for uh, two-spirit uh, as being gay by people. Safe spaces, because I'm, I'm finding a lot of people who have multiple barriers. So maybe, I don't know if you have address or maybe address this in your research in terms of uh, advocacy, because I'm really appreciated your presentation around more advocacy around uh, funding. Thank you. I think only to say yes. <laughs> yes, we need more of that, um, for sure. And we, I mean, we need queer specific services, um, but we also need to make other spaces safe for queer people who use drugs, right? I mean, it's not either or. Um, just to quickly say something in response to the previous uh, comment, um, the recommendations in the draft action agenda include addressing uh, better access to harm reduction in both virtual and physical spaces that queer people occupy, including uh, where we have sex and use substances. So um, when we were trying to get some information about the extent to which there is any of this harm reduction outreach happening in bathhouses, for example, across the country, and getting really uh, conflicting and murky information about whether it's happening or not, and that's because I think it's probably happening in some places, but a little bit uh, on the down low, right? Um, because Business owners are sometimes going to have issues with that. That's certainly been historically a problem. But I think it's something that we need to actually figure out. And I think implementation research there actually would be useful as well. Uh, and it doesn't need to be complicated. But figuring out some best practices about how to bring those harm reduction outreach services into bathhouses, for example, or bring it into virtual online spaces um, would be really useful. Because I think there's a lot of 
there's a lot of experience out there, at least on the virtual side, maybe a little less on the physical spaces side, uh, but or at least people are willing to cop to. But I think gathering some of that experience could be really helpful in figuring out how to improve access to those services. So if anybody has more information about that that they'd like to share, either openly or just quietly, I'd love to hear about it. All right, so I'm not seeing any uh, more folks at the, yes, we do have one more question. Last but not least. J'ai une question pour Max. Tu as dit que tu uh, vas commencer recrutement pour uh, la deuxième partie de ta, ton recherche. Est-ce que tu peux parler brièvement qu'est-ce que tu as fait pour la uh, première partie et comment est-ce que la deuxième partie va avancer la première? Certainement. Donc, euh, la première partie, la métasynthèse, les résultats que je viens de présenter aujourd'hui, euh, L'analyse est toujours en cours, euh, mais déjà les résultats, les résultats préliminaires nous permettent d'avoir une, une, une meilleure idée, une bonne idée de, des, euh, des trous, si on veut, dans, dans, dans les connaissances, dans la littérature. Spécifiquement, euh, ce, que je, ce que je repère, il y a vraiment un manque de, de compréhension par rapport au, euh, à comment le consentement peut être négocié dans, dans des contextes où, justement, c'est flou euh, ou dans des contextes où, justement, euh, le, le, exactement la ligne entre euh, l'acte consensuel ou non consensuel est flou ou lorsque le, une personne, par exemple, peut passer rapidement d'un état de plaisir à un état de détresse, comment est-ce que euh, le consentement peut être négocié tant tant à travers, la, si on veut, tant à travers de, de la personne que son partenaire, donc vraiment l'interaction entre les deux. Et le projet, euh, la deuxième phase qui, qui commence euh, maintenant, euh, le, le photovoie est une méthode qui est participative, mais qui est aussi, euh, qui est aussi réflexive, et je pense que une, ça va vraiment aider à mieux comprendre le phénomène de consentement de permettre euh, aux personnes de vraiment réfléchir à leur expérience euh, et de voir comment ils peuvent l'exprimer à travers euh, des moyens artistiques, à travers la photo, permettre vraiment d'aller plus, plus loin dans, dans la compréhension que, par exemple, si c'était simplement un, une entrevue. Je pense que les questions de consentement sont très complexes. Euh, on, on sait tous un peu qu'est-ce qu'est le consentement, mais si on se met vraiment à réfléchir à comment on, on le donne ou comment on le négocie dans nos propres, euh, nos propres vies, je pense que ça demande une réflexion plus approfondie euh, ce que cette méthode va permettre. All right. Donc, c'est tout le temps qu'on a pour aujourd'hui. Merci à tout le monde d'être venu, d'avoir assisté. That's all the time we have today. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the session. Can we please... Give a nice round of applause to our fantastic presenters.